O oh God, we thank you for your Son, who chose the path of suffering for the sake of the world. Humble us by his example. Point us to the path of obedience and give us strength to follow your commands. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Today's reading is from Romans. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this you will heap burning coals on their head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Word of God, Word of Life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The word of the Lord. A grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My name is Chris Odie, and I serve as the pastor of the Livingstones Prison Congregation. It's an honor to be here with you today. It's been about a year since the last time I spoke to Agnes Day, albeit last time it was in person, and I look forward to when we can all be back together and do it again that way. So many of you already have a sense of what Livingstones is, and still, I'm going to take a moment to explain it, just in case anybody's new or just likes to hear it again. So bear with me. It will tie back to today's scripture, to the ministry of Agnes Day, as well as your own life. In worst case, I am online and pre-recorded, which means that you can go grab a refill for your coffee. So, Living Stones is a ministry started by and primarily sponsored by Lutheran churches in southwestern Washington for the past 14 years. It is, as it sounds like, a congregation inside a prison. It is a ministry that operates inside the Washington Correction Center in Shelton, one of our men's facilities here in Washington State. And it is a ministry that focuses on, focuses on connecting incarcerated men, regular volunteers, visitors from outside congregations, developing reentry resources, and um, also speaking to groups on the outside, either on a Sunday morning or community groups during the week. Pre-pandemic, we were getting close to starting a second site at one of the prisons in Monroe, or one of the facilities in Monroe, sponsored by the Northwest Washington Synod and connected to many ecumenical volunteers up there. And the plan is still, once the pandemic is over, to actually do that. And the work that we do is important, but I need to tell you that right now in the midst of COVID, it is all the more important. 
Due to the pandemic, the Washington Department of Corrections made the decision back in March to basically shut down the prisons to visitors and volunteers in order to protect the inmates and the staff. As a result, that means that there is pretty much no outside programming. And the chapel at WCC, where I work, has been converted into a regional recovery center for inmates who test positive in Washington State, which means that we now worship in the dining hall, the staff dining hall, which is uh, fragrant. I'll put it that way. Due to my badge status, I am still able to get inside, even though our volunteers cannot. But that means that when I go inside and help lead worship for some of the Christian groups or spend time with other guys, whether they're part of those groups or not, that means that we are one of the well, actually, we're really the only outside programming still happening at WCC these past six months. And realistically, we expect that this could be the situation going into 2021. So I want to thank you for welcoming me here today. I want to thank you for supporting Living Stones over the years. And I want to really emphasize that it is only because of the support of congregations like Agnes Day and individuals like yourself that we are able to do this work at all, but especially right now. It is, as you would imagine, harder for us to get support these days. So I encourage you to please consider checking out our website, livingstonesprisoncongregation.com. I know it's a long name, but all the words are simple to spell, so that's nice. You can check out some footage that we have shot from inside the prison before the pandemic. You can sign up to receive our monthly newsletter. You can even send uh, devotionals or other materials that we can then put in a newsletter that goes inside to the men that frankly means a lot to them. We can always use more contributions for that. Um, you can donate electronically. Please feel free to go ahead and do that. And you can just keep abreast of what we're up to. Every month we do a ministry check-in on Zoom. You are very much invited to be a part of that as well. And uh, that's it. That's the basics of Living Stones right now. So I thank you for sitting through what I often call the pitch, but also recognizing that honestly, Without it, without support from folks like yourself, we could not do this. So thank you. Thank you on behalf of the men, the volunteers who so badly want to be allowed back inside but are having to wait. Thank you for all that you have done and will do in the future. So, on to scripture. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? What will they give in return for their life? Now, I don't know about you, but for as far back as I can remember, I have always been interested in history, in facts, in figures, in people and places, in the minutia of history, the, the various ways in which it fits together. The world in which we live is indescribably shaped by the route in which we got here. And I find value in trying to better understand that route and learn from it. At the end of the day, personally, I would rather learn and adjust from the mistakes and triumphs of the past than waste a lot of time or energy recreating them. You've probably heard it said at one point or another, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And of course, there is that corollary. I don't know why I wanted to use that word since I can't pronounce it. Those who learn from history are doomed to live with those who fail to learn from it. That's the point where I say something about the fact that, you know, we had a pandemic 100 years ago and learned that masks and social distancing was important. Who could have thought? Anyway, by extension from that love for history, I think about legacies a lot. I don't know if I do it more than other people do, but it feels to me like it crosses my mind a lot. I don't mean legacy in an arrogant way, but I mean legacy in the sense of how our lives are institutions, our actions, leave an impact. What those ripples look like, how they play out over the years, not just for ourselves, but for others, for our communities. You know, some of it is internal. I just, as far back as I can recall, I've always felt this strong need to leave things better than I found them. You know, Living Stones is my third call as a pastor. My first two were what are called redevelopment calls, which is where you serve a struggling congregation and try to help them um, rethink and reimagine how they minister in their community. You know, it's all about taking something that already exists and trying to, um, to make it better, to help it to do its work better going forward. 
And a huge piece of how you do that is learning from a congregation's past and helping them to understand how to honor that past without worshiping it. And I'm pretty sure as soon as I said that, some of you know what I mean. Because, frankly, I have yet to meet a congregation, whether as a pastor, as a congregant, or as a visitor, I have yet to meet a congregation that didn't have at least a few folk who were distracted by their worship for the way things used to be. You follow me? Worshiping the idea of the way things used to be. And I say worship deliberately. Because we learn from Scripture that idolatry is not just about golden statues and pagan altars. Idolatry is anything that replaces God in our lives. And for many people, for many well-intentioned, good Christian people, the past becomes an idol to be worshipped in God's place. Don't always realize it. In fact, frequently don't realize it at all. But it, frankly, is what often has led to those congregations that I've done redevelopment work with unfortunately, it's part of what's helped them get to the need to need redevelopment, worshiping the past. But I think another reason I think about legacies so often is because I'm a pastor, and I have done probably 100 or so funerals over the years. The vast majority of them for people who I have never met, hearing stories about their lives and, by extension, their legacies. And at the risk of sounding cliche, from that, I have learned a lot about what really matters. I have yet to have a child say, you know, I really wish dad had been home less. I wish he'd been home less often. I wish he'd worked more. I've yet to have a spouse say to me, you know, I really wish she'd been harder or colder. I wish she hadn't been so full of God's love. Nobody says at a funeral, you know, if only our relationship had been more distant. You know, I'm sure today would be much easier if we just hadn't cared about each other so much. I've yet to minister at a funeral where, you know, this person really just cared about other people too much. I've yet to minister at a funeral where that's been listed as a character flaw. Jesus today challenges his disciples, and by extension us, about what really truly matters in our life. They were sucked up in notions of power and glory. What they had understood the Messiah was supposed to be, the Christ, the anointed, was supposed to be this holy warrior sent to cast out Roman oppressors and restore a theocracy. We all know that was mistaken. We all know the story of Jesus and his ministry and his gospel would turn out quite differently. Today, 2,000 years later, we know that. But in that time, in that place, the disciples are still very hooked into that. That's why... Peter is so aghast at what Jesus has said about what his ark is going to look like is because he is still focused on this idea of what triumph looks, looks like, what success looks like, what the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed looks like. And we know that what it looks like ultimately is a story of love and humility and sacrifice for others. And you've heard it before. You've heard about Jesus healing and blessing and forgiving people, and you've heard about the crucifixion and the resurrection, and how all of that is really truly a testimony to the failure of human hatred to conquer God's love. It is a testimony to what true power looks like, what true glory looks like, and yet, and yet, I dare say that for many of us today, for many well-intentioned, good Christian people, I dare say that many still get that wrong. Still get the idea of that glory and power wrong. I mentioned my love for history at the start. I have long thought that one of the best things to happen to Christianity was when Emperor Constantine made it legal, when it became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Some way back vestigial part of your brain just remembered that from history classes long ago. Oh yeah, Constantine, that's right. No longer illegal to be, uh, to be a Christian. And it was one of the best things to happen to Christianity because people could worship safely and openly and the gospel could spread freely. And I have long thought that one of the worst things to happen to Christianity was when Emperor Constantine made it legal, when it became the official religion of the Roman Empire. 
because in that moment, secular power and glory clutched their fingers around the heart of the church and its people. You want an example of Christians distracted, corrupted by power and glory? It's late August 2020. Google Jerry Falwell Jr. Actually, better, better don't. Just it's not worth it. We are preparing for an election in a couple months, but don't worry. I'm not about to get political. Or maybe I am. I, I don't know. At the end of the day, Jesus' gospel is inherently political. It's centered on how we treat our neighbor as much as how we live our relationship with God. And in that bit about neighbors makes it inherently political, whether we like it or not, whether we want to admit it or not. You literally cannot practice Christianity. You cannot practice Christianity faithfully and not care about your neighbor's well-being. You, you just can't. Like, those are intrinsically connected as soon as your neighbor stops mattering you have failed as soon as the well-being of your neighbor is no longer important you have failed at exercising practicing christianity you just can't do it they go they cannot be broken apart so and i honestly didn't know that's where today's message was going to go that's where it went so when your ballot arrives, ask yourself if the person you're checking off generally reflects the gospel, reflects the love of God and neighbor we know in Christ, or if they generally reflect something else. If they reflect the world that Christ has called us to create, or they reflect something else. And if you're unsure where to start, I actually think Paul's reading today was amazing. Paul's words today are fantastic. And they are as good a measuring stick for crafting a legacy, a legacy as an individual, a legacy as a people, a legacy as a nation, as any could aspire to. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showering and showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. If you want to leave a legacy as an individual, as a people, as a nation, those are the sorts of things we should aspire to. And those are the sorts of things that we should look to in our leaders. Every week, I get this incredibly humbling experience of going inside a prison and working with a group of men who are so aware, for the most part, of when and how they have fallen short of that promise. A group of men who try so hard to not be who they were, to turn their lives around. It is an honor to serve as the pastor of Living Stones. And I thank you so much for the contributions and support that you have offered up that have blessed me to get to do that. Amen.
confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of faithfulness, you bid your people to follow Jesus. Set the mind of your church on divine things. Grant us trust in you that we lose our lives for the sake of Christ and thereby discover joy in life through him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of wonder, the earth is yours and all that is in it. Heal your creation and give us eyes to see the world as you do. As the seasons change, pattern the rhythm of our lives in harmony with creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all nations, you call us to live peaceably with all. Give us ears to hear one another, even those we name as enemies. Fill all leaders with mercy and understanding, that they advocate and genuinely care for those who are poor and most vulnerable in their communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of salvation, you promise to deliver us. Give those who suffer a strong sense of your presence and love. Accompany those who are uncertain during this time of pandemic. Raise the spirits of those who are despairing and heal the sick, especially those we name aloud or silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of community, you call us to rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, and persevere in prayer. Make our congregation a workshop of your love. When we quarrel, bring reconciliation. Help us overcome evil with good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of renewal, you call Pastor Seth as a minister of word and sacrament. Give him refreshment and a renewed zeal for proclaiming the gospel. During his sabbatical rest, fill him with your spirit and enrich his life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of wisdom, you give strength and courage to teachers and students returning to school in uncertain times. Protect and care for all students, teachers, and school workers as they embark on a new school year. Fill their classrooms with, with joy and discovery that they may grow in knowledge and community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all grace, you give us everlasting life. In love, we recall your holy ones who now live in your undying light. In our remembering, give us a foretaste of the feast to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we individually prepare the elements for Holy Communion in our homes, we give thanks to each of you who have contributed to the ministry of Agnus Day with your tithes and offerings. Thank you for your generosity. Please join me in helping our ministry be sustained and grow by following the link in the video description to donate your gift now. Even though we cannot physically gather, we can still offer our gifts together to do God's work.
We are now entering into a time of communion together. If you are planning to receive the sacrament today, make sure that you have some kind of bread or cracker and wine or juice ready. If you are not receiving communion today, please still join in praying the Eucharistic prayer with me and with all of us as found in your bulletin as we welcome the presence of Jesus into our hearts and our homes this day. Let us pray. Blessed are you, compassionate and faithful God, and how wonderful the work of your hands. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embraced a people as your own and filled them with longing for a peace that would last and a justice that would never fail. Through countless generations, your people hungered for the bread of freedom. From them you raised up Jesus, the living bread, in whom ancient hungers were satisfied. He healed the sick, though he himself would suffer. He offered life to sinners, yet death would hunt him down. With a love stronger than death, he opened wide his arms and surrendered his spirit. Loving God, let your Holy Spirit move in power over us and over our earthly gifts of bread and wine, that they may become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. On the night before he met with death, Jesus came to the table with the women and men he loved. He took bread and praised you, God of all creation. He blessed and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he poured a final cup of wine and blessed you, God of all creation. He passed the cup among his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the cup of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Together let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Ever gentle God, we commemorate Jesus, your Son. Death could not bind him, for you raised him up in the spirit of holiness and exalted him as the first of creation. May his coming in glory find us ever watchful in prayer, strong in love, and faithful to the breaking of the bread. Rejoicing in the Holy Spirit, your whole church offers thanks and praise with all your servants whose lives bring hope to this world. Awaken to the undying light of pardon and peace those who have fallen asleep in faith. Gather them all into communion with all your saints. Then at last will all creation be one and all divisions healed, and we shall join in singing your praise through Jesus Christ, eternal word. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, all loving God, forever and ever. Amen. Together, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. For those who are not receiving communion today, receive this blessing. May you know the presence and love of the one who has gone to the cross with us and for us, who promises that beyond grief and the grave there is life everlasting, now and always. Amen. If you are receiving communion today, receive this promise. This is the body of Christ given for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and always. Amen.
God bless you in your week.